we doing? It's good. It is absolutely my honor to be here today. And, you know, I love how God moves and the fact that there is not a single person that is here today that is here by accident. God, I know, is going to speak to every single one of us, every single one of us that's online today. I know God has got you here, got you online for a reason. He's going to speak to us. And I just strongly believe we're not here just to go through the motions of a service this morning. We're here to hear from God and we're here for Him to change us, for Him to speak to us, for Him to challenge us. So God, I just pray right now in this moment. God, that you would have your way in our hearts. I pray that you would speak. I pray that you'd give us clarity. God, we just, we're not thinking about lunch right now. We're not thinking about the next things after the service. God, we're thinking about you and what you want to do through us. And God, we just pray that we would open our hearts to what you want to reveal. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. Why don't we give our God an amazing hand and take your seats. You know, I do just, I want to start by honouring your amazing senior pastors. They are absolutely incredible, and uh, we, we did meet them years ago now, and I just love their genuine heart and belief in people. You know, thank you for believing in me today to have me here, and I just, I love the power of longevity. You know, the older that I get, and I'm actually turning 40 next week, so we're family now because you know my age. But, you know, the older I get, the more I appreciate longevity in ministry because it's rare. It's very rare for someone to have the character, the tenacity, the love for Jesus and the love for people to serve him in his house for so many years. So I just want you first and foremost, why don't we put our hands together for your incredible senior pastors. (laughs) Pastor John Lois, thank you so much. So I want to do this message today and it's called, What Are You Entertaining? What are you entertaining? You know, I don't know about you, but when COVID hit and all the lockdowns hit, I did not see it coming. My husband and I, Craig, we have um, three children. And uh, in February last year, before everything hit, we were actually in Japan snowboarding together for, for 10 days. And I remember watching the news in Japan and uh, primary schools were starting to shut down and homeschooling was happening. And I remember watching the news there and thinking to myself with deep satisfaction, I am so glad I live in Australia because there is no way that we would ever homeschool in Australia. Like there's no way we'll ever have those crazy kind of lockdowns. And God was just laughing to himself because, you know, nine months later of homeschooling, Jesus help us. You know, I had an 11-year-old, an 8-year-old and a 2-year-old. Like it was just crazy times at home. You know, nine months later, I reckon God was just giggling to himself, going, you have no idea about what's to come. But who knows in life, there are so many unexpected things that hit our path. So many things that we have no control over, that we did not see coming, that we did not expect, that we cannot foresee, and yet God is in the middle of it all. And God is using it all for his kingdom and his glory. And I think the example of Joseph, God has been speaking to me so much about this, especially over this COVID time. The example of Joseph, he's just an incredible man. He starts out when he was very young, being given these incredible dreams from God about people bowing down to him and then the leader that he was going to become. But this young guy, Joseph, doesn't have much wisdom. And so he shares to his brothers the dream that he had and his dad as well, his father, the dream that he had. And they all mock him and scoff him. The Bible says that it causes the brothers to hate him even more. And so they end up throwing him down a well and then selling him into slavery. And then Joseph does really well as a slave until Potiphar's wife, his master's wife, throws him into prison. And he ends up in slavery and prison for 13 years. 13 years. So he has these incredible God promises, this amazing future, and then he's thrown into prison for 13 years. Like, he wouldn't have seen that coming. It was setback after setback for him. Even when he was in prison and he interpreted the baker's um, dream and, you know, these, the, uh, the chief, the cupbearer's dream, and, and then the cupbearer goes to the king and Joseph says to him, don't forget me. The cupbearer forgets him for another two years. It was disappointment after disappointment. 
But you know what I love about Joseph? He navigated it all without it infecting his inner world. He navigated the disappointment, the hurt, the rejection, the betrayal, the not understanding, the God, where the flip are you for 13 years? He navigated it all without it affecting his heart, without it getting in his eternal world. And so when his time came to be released as second in command to all of Egypt, when the timing came for God's plan to be revealed, his heart was pure. His heart was right. His heart was ready to go. In fact, when he confronted his brothers, he said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what has now been done, the saving of many lives. So don't you love that? See, Joseph, he found himself in the middle of unfair circumstances, but he didn't allow those circumstances to get on the inside of him. Through it all, he kept his heart free. And I love that the Bible talks about the power of our heart, the condition of our heart so much. And Matthew 5, verse 8, it says, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Come on, how often do we try and get everything around us right externally without worrying about our heart and internally what's actually going on? Luke 6 verse 45 says, A good man brings out good things of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored out of his heart. Proverbs 4 verse 23 puts it like this, Above all else. This isn't just a suggestion. This isn't just a side thing that we're going to look at every now and then. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. You know, this COVID season has been a crazy season, but I know God has got so much more for us. So much more for us as his church, as his kids, so much more purpose for us to step into whatever phase of life we find ourselves in. God has got more. But I do know as well that we're in a season like never before when stuff can get on the inside of us that will stop what God wants to do through us. More than ever before, we have to guard the condition of our heart. Man, you look at the Bible. If Judas could get stuff evil in his heart when he was around the presence of Jesus all the time, when he could see the miraculous, dead being raised, sick people healed. Yet the Bible says the love of money got in his heart. And because of that, he lost the God purpose and God potential on his life. If it can happen to Judas, it can happen to every single one of us, me included. See, I find the greatest releaser of my ministry It's the condition of my heart. And it's also the greatest challenge, the greatest thing that can stop me and limit me. So what are we entertaining? So I have this little set up here on stage, and it's kind of similar to how Craig and I first started out our married life. We've been married for almost 20 years now. But we got married when we were just very young, and we had this very small house that we lived in. It was literally from about here to the door big, and it was just a little bedroom in it as well, and a bathroom as well. We used to call it the love shack. And it worked, it worked well because I am not a good cook or entertainer at all. I've grown as I've had children, but back then we just ate out all the time. We were youth pastors, so we were constantly busy. In fact, I cooked so little that one day I put a roast chicken in our little wee oven thing that we had, and I forgot about it. And three months later, I, true story, three months later, I opened the oven. This is how bad I am as a cook. Three months later, I opened up the oven, and it was like it walked out to me, like, It was that overgrown with moss and, you know, with mold. And I didn't know quite else what was in there. But, no, I just, it was just that phase of our lives. Craig is a very blessed man to have me as his wife. But we're just in a stage where, you know, we were just out all the time. But one thing we realized when we were married is that people just didn't pop out, just pop into your home anymore like we used to when we lived a whole heap of us, a group of my friends, we lived as housemates. People just pop around all the time. 
But when we had our own place, we chose who we entertained. We chose who we allowed into our space. And you know what? It's exactly the same when it comes to our heart, when it comes to our internal world. We get to choose what we entertain. We get to choose what we allow into our heart space. But I'm going to ask a few people to come and help me with this illustration if the first person can come up. Because, see, what we end up doing is often we end up entertaining whatever comes knocking at the door of our life. So if you can just come knocking. So, you know, we hear a knock. We're like, okay, who are, oh, fear and anxiety. You're everywhere at the moment, all through the media, wherever I look, newspapers, social media. Just come on in. Come have a seat. You know, what we do is we, we entertain this stuff. We're like, okay, you came knocking, so I might as well entertain you. Like, have a seat at my table. And what we do is we allow fear and anxiety to speak to us. And we just think it's normal because it's knocking at the door of our life. Like, it's everywhere around us. It's whatever we see. So I'm just going to, you know, you're allowed to speak to me. I, I entertain you. I welcome you into my home. And we do it just because it's there. If I can have my next example, please. Again, there's this knock at the door of our heart and, oh, insecurity, come on in. You can have, you can have a seat at the table too. It's actually, it's great that you're here because, you know what, when you're here, it means that I don't need to take risks and I can just play things really safe and just stay in my own little comfort zone and not step out and, you know, not step into the God purpose that he has for my life because insecurity, you're here and I can just get really comfy and really settled, which is awesome. If I could have my next example, please. Who's going to come knocking next? Oh, it's disappointment. Disappointment, come on in. You know, I've just, you know, there has been a lot of disappointments over this COVID season. Again, you can just take a seat. Again, it's just, it's really good to have you here. And, you know, it's great because I just feel safe with disappointment and I'm not going to take risks anymore because, you know, it's just good not to take risks and just to settle in life because, you know, life is just going to throw me stuff. And so it's just good that I just allow disappointment to speak to me. And, and then offense comes knocking. Oh, offense, why don't you come in? Yeah, it's, it's great to have you at my table as well. You can take a seat as well. And you know what? It's actually really good that you're here because you know what it means that if I'm not going to step into my destiny, it's everyone else's fault. Like it's the church's fault or it's my friend's fault or it's my family's fault. And I don't need to step out into any purpose whatsoever. I don't need to allow God to shape me and change me because it's their fault and it's their stuff and what they did to me. And and so what we do is we entertain this stuff. And then we wonder why our life is so limited and contained. We wonder, God, why are you not moving in my life? God, why do I feel so trapped? Because look at what we're entertaining. Look at what we have at the seat of our table. Like there's something that's got to rise up in us about our heart space, that it's our space. And this stuff has no right to enter. Just because it's there knocking, just because it's there does not give it right to enter. It does not mean we have to entertain this stuff. No, a long time ago, probably 15 years ago, we used to live out at West Auckland. And where we had our home was a pretty rough neighborhood. And one day I had a whole group of our leaders around and we had this girls' night together and my husband was out at the time, and the girls left, and I opened up our back door to go into our backyard, and our backyard was secured by all these really high fences, and stepped out into our backyard and put the rubbish out, and as I turned back around, there was this huge guy that had scaled the fence and got into our backyard, and he was standing between me and the house to get back in. He had a hoodie over his face, and he was just giggling to himself. And you know, in those moments, you know, you just have those random moments where you're like, what would I do in that space? I always thought that I would freeze. I wouldn't be able to, to know what to do. But the exact opposite happened. Like in me, this thing rose up. What are you doing here? I remember yelling in his face. I'm like, what the flip are you doing here? And he just like stood there like that. 
and he froze, and he let me run back in the house. I slammed the door. I was looking for the knife. I would have castrated him. I would have done whatever necessary to defend myself because it was my house. It was my place. It was my authority. It was my domain. And you know what? We've got to get like that with our heart space. When stuff comes in that shouldn't be there, there's something that's got to rise up and be like, okay, enough's enough. I'm making my stand. This stuff has had its way for too long. It may feel like just the furniture that's in my heart because it's been there for so long, but it does not have to keep being there. It does not have any right to be there apart from the right that I give it. We've got to take back our heart space. Take back what is ours. Why don't we give the team an amazing hand? Thank you, guys. So what I want to do really quickly is just look at what it means to entertain the right way. When it comes to our heart space, how do we entertain the right way? And the first thing is that we've got to entertain at a higher caliber. You know, have you noticed how we so easily in our heart space entertain the wrong things? Things like fear, and I could just go into so many other things today, jealousy, envy, comparison. You know, so many other things that we can entertain that's not of God. And so easy, those things just have their way in our lives. You know, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. It's desperately wicked. So if we're just blasé, about the area of our internal world. The wrong things will have its way. That's why we've got to be so diligent with it, the Bible says. That's why we've got to be so aware of what we're entertaining. A.W. Tozer says this, the neglected heart will soon be a heart overrun with worldly things. The neglected life will soon become a moral chaos. We have to be so intentional and so deliberate at what is going on in our heart. You know, we've got to take a moment, and this is what I want to do this morning, us to do is to take a stock take and look at our heart and go, you know what, what am I entertaining? What is going on in my heart space that should not be there? What is going on that's stopping me, that's limiting me from really living in the fullness of what God's got for me? Because you've got to hear it this morning. The stuff that's limiting you, it is not of God. And you have authority to get it out of your heart, to not allow it to have control any longer. We've got to do a stock take of what is going on in our world to go to the heights that God wants us to go to. Now, when I was just a young teenager, just 14, I went on my first hiking trip to Great Barrier Reef where we scaled these huge mountains And they gave us this really limited list of what we were allowed to take with us. And, you know, because we were carrying our tents, our cooking equipment, everything. And, you know, as your typical 14-year-old girl, I just tried to sneak in more than was on the list. But when we got to school, we actually had to lay out everything that was in our backpacks. And we could only take the necessities, only take what was good for us. And it was like only three hours into the first hike that I was so glad I didn't have the extra baggage. There are heights that God wants to take you into. New levels he wants you to step into. But there's excess baggage, excess stuff that we've got to deal with, that we've got to look at. We've got to go, God, what do you need to do in my heart surgery-wise to get rid of this stuff? There have been so many moments where God has had to do this in my life. Well, you know, I've just felt stuck. I felt like, God, I can't do this anymore. What is going on? And God has had to highlight things to me and go, you know what? That going on in your heart there, that can't stay there anymore for me to take you where I want to take you. You've got to allow me to do heart surgery to uproot what's going on. You know, example is, I remember when we first transitioned our ministry from youth and young adults into uh, leading one of our campuses, and this was back in Auckland. And I just remember feeling so inadequate to lead adults. 
And I remember going to God and just going, God, why am I feeling like this? Because it's, it's stopping me stepping into the authority that you've got for me. And I remember God showing me how the first job I had, I'd done my degree in psychology and then my master's in social work. And so I was in a placement in Auckland sexual abuse where women were raped or abused. I sat, we sat with them in their medical examination and then when they had their statement to the police. So it was a really full-on job. But I remember one of my team mem- members saying to me, because I was the youngest on team by far, probably about 10 years. And I remember them saying to me, you are too young for this job. You're too inexperienced. You shouldn't be here. And I realized God highlighted how that lie had got lodged into my heart. I would believed that lie, and it had allowed this inadequacy in me and this insecurity to grow, to become this. So I got to this place where I, I, can't, I can't lead adults. I can't lead others like that. I'm too young. And God had to uproot that lie that had got lodged in my heart with his truth. And I had to stand going, you know what? If God has called me, he has equipped me. If God has called me to this, I don't do this by my might and my mouth, my power, but by his spirit, I'm called, I'm chosen by him. And so I had to uproot the lie with his truth. I had to allow God to do heart surgery. And we've got to allow him to do that. Is that making sense today? The second thing, and entertaining the right way, and the last one, is we've got to be the bouncer. We've got to be the bouncer. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, keep vigilant watch over your heart. Vigilant watch. Vigilant watch. We can't just let whatever get in. Like a bouncer does as the security for an event, they stand at the door And they have a list of what can get in and what goes out. And just like that, we've got to have our list. Okay, what does God say? Someone fear presents itself to me. What does my Bible say? It says that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So fear, when you come knocking, -uh -uh, you don't actually get in because I've got a spirit of that God has given me, a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So fear does not have its way. So we've got to get our list out. What does God say? And if it doesn't line up with God's word, it doesn't get in. And you know what? This takes time, I've discovered. This takes consistency of getting God's word, discipline of thinking. I love Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She says you can change your thinking, you can change your internal world by being deliberate to seven times a day with God's truth, with his wisdom. Seven times a day allowing scripture to change who we are, to change what is going on in the inside. Proverbs 7, verse 4 to, 4 to 5 says, My teaching is as precious as your eyesight. Come on, how precious is our eyesight? That's how precious God's Word is. Guard it. Write it out on the back of your hands. Etch it on the chambers of your heart. Come on, we're going to be disciplined with the Word of God. Allow it to repeat itself over and over and over again until it drops from our head into our heart. Come on, it takes a while for things to go from here to here. It takes consistency, discipline, allowing God to speak consistently to us. Psychologists talk talk about this in terms of automaticity, which is learning something so much that it becomes an automatic response. That's why pilots have to spend 1,300 to 1,500 hours of flying before they're allowed to carry commercial passengers in their planes because their response, everything has to become automatic, not deliberate. And it's got to be the same with the Word of God, with our thinking, allowing it to become so part of our thinking that it becomes automatic. I love what Tim Keller says, the gospel if it is really believed, removes neediness. The need to be constantly respected, appreciated, and well-regarded. The need to have everything in your life go well. The need to have power over others. All of these great deep needs continue to control you only because the concept of the glorious God delighting in you with all his being is just that. It's a concept. Nothing more. This is so powerful. Our hearts don't believe it. 
So they operate in default mold, mode. The Apostle Paul is saying that if you really want to change, you must let the gospel teach you. That is to train, discipline, coach you over a period of time. You must let the gospel argue with you. You must let the gospel sink down deeply into your heart until it changes your motivation and views and attitudes. How powerful is that? that we actually allow the Word of God to become part of the inner framework of who we are. And you know what? I believe today that for so many of us, this is going to be a line in the sand moment. A line in the sand moment going, you know what? Enough is enough. I have entertained that for too long. It's had its way for too long. And I'm drawing a line in the sand and saying, it's not, it's not being entertained any longer. I'm entertaining what is good. I'm entertaining what God wants me to fill with. See, it's not just getting the wrong stuff out, but it's getting the right stuff in. Love, his love, his peace. It's, I'm entertaining the good stuff. I'm not letting have the wrong stuff have its way anymore. And you know what? When we do that, it changes things for the generations. If I could have the keys player up, please. It changes things for the generations. Now, I've seen this happen with our family. My dad is my hero. He is an absolute man of God, man of integrity, loves Jesus with everything. But he was born as a product of rape. And it happened way back in the 1970s. And so back in that day, women who had a baby out of wedlock, it didn't happen very often. And society absolutely shunned him. My dad was the only kid in his entire school that didn't have a dad. And Nobody knew it was a rape because you didn't talk about those things in those days. So my grandmother was shunned. My dad was shunned. Grew up, abused, beaten most days in school. Absolutely, you could not get more tragic in his childhood. And then my grandma radically met Jesus one day. And my dad did years later as well. And Jesus just radically became the father to him that he never had. And I remember my dad saying, because today he's an incredibly successful businessman and has five children. We all love Jesus, all in church serving him. And I remember people saying to my dad, well, how, how did you do it? You know, such brokenness to God bringing such restoration. And he said, I remember walking down the street one day as this young man. And I just recently met Jesus and I started to discover his word, you know, promises like Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Dad said, I remember walking down the street one day and going, well, you know what? If God says about that about me, despite what life has told me, I'm drawing a line in the sand right now and I'm choosing to take on God's word. I'm choosing to take on his truth. The abuse, the tragedy that I've experienced, no longer is that going to define me. What defines me is God's word. And from that point on, it was a turning point because he decided this is what I'm entertaining. This is what I'm going to allow in. So the question I want to ask you today is what have you been entertaining? shouldn't be entertaining? What are we allowing in our heart space that shouldn't be there? And I know, you know, there are some here today, there are some that are joining online. And if you're to be honest, you haven't actually allowed Jesus into your heart space. You know, the Bible says that He is the Lord of our heart. Christianity isn't about giving everything out, all good on the outside of our world. It's about Jesus being Lord of our lives, Lord of our hearts, allowing Him to bring eternal change. I love what it says in Romans 10 verse 9, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Believing in Jesus is a heart response. That He died over 2,000 years ago, rose from the dead so that we could have freedom that we could know Him. And this morning, if you're here in this auditorium and if you're online, and today you want to say, you know what, I want to make that decision to allow Jesus to be the Lord of my life. We can't battle stuff in our heart on our own. We need Him. 
And if you're saying, you know what, I want to make that decision this morning to allow Him to be Lord. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask all of us to close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you're here and you're saying, you know what, that's me. I want to make that decision to allow Jesus to be Lord of my life. You know, once you may have made that decision, if you're to be honest, you know other things have got in your heart and you're not allowing Him to take the lead, to be Lord like He needs to be. So if that's you today and you're saying, I want to recommit my life or for the very first time, I want to give my life to Jesus. Just right where you're sitting, why don't you raise your hands to heaven and say, hey, that's me today. I want to allow Jesus to be the Lord of my life. For those that are online, there's a click button that you can push, a raise hand button. You're saying, hey, that's me today. I want to make that decision to allow Jesus to be Lord of my life today, to allow Him to have His way. Fantastic. What we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer for all those that raise their hands. We're going to say, Jesus, invite me. I invite you into my life. I ask you to be my Lord, the Lord of my heart. I'm sorry for my wrongs. I give them to you. I want new life in you. I give you my heart. I want to know your love, your joy, and your peace. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Come on, why don't we give a hand to all those that made that amazing decision. All those that are online, it's brilliant. You know what, as we end, I just love us to stand to our feet. And I think it'll be awesome to finish with worship.